I understand you were born in St. Louis. What uh, brought you to Monterey? Well, uh, I, w I was out of high school and started college just in 29 when the de big depression hit. And although I had a scholarship, um, I had a hard time getting by and I eventually had to, had to quit the university because I couldn't have, it wasn't an athletic scholarship. It was just a, a regular one. And so I, I, they didn't provide me with food or art materials or, mm -hmm. or anything like that. It's just tuition. And so when the depression hit and, and I, would, I would work all night sometimes for 25 cents an hour, that was, that was a, just a doing artwork from uh, display windows. Mm -hmm. And I just ran out of money and, and we used to have um, many young, young people after a year close, very close to being a youngster, I can tell. And they had all sorts of philosophic discussions at um, lunchtime in the cafeteria as to what they were going to do with their lives. And I, I knew, I, I, I always used to tell interviewers that I borrow things from the poet. And one of the things that was very true is that I, since I was five years old, I was single-minded and unperplexed like a migratory bird. And so, when so many young people, and you hear them today, well, what am I doing? I haven't got it all together. I don't know where I'm at, or I don't know where my space is, or my sp Well, anyway, I knew at five years old. What? But because of the depression, I knew that I had uh, nobody in the Middle West, or nobody in the art division wanted to stay there. They wanted to go either east or west. Mm -hmm. And since I was impoverished then, but had an old board, I um, came west, which was sensible because for a while I had to sleep in the desert. And if I'd have gone to New York, I, I, of course there are people doing it now, but in those days mm -hmm. I couldn't have existed through so, winter. And, so and what so was I, the year that you came? To, what was the year that you came to, Penin to the peninsula, to Monterey? Well, I didn't come to the peninsula. I came to Southern California, and it was through John Steinbeck and and his friend Ed Ricketts that. Um, because after coming to West, as I told you, and, and, and living on, I had to eat, eat some snakes and weeds and things like that, living in, but I was a young man, you were able to do things like that. And, mm -hmm. and then I, I, uh, I got a job painting up a large mural, a 1,400 foot mural for a post office. And that, that took two years, but it also provided me some with some money. And John Steinbeck and Ed Rickett came to see my paintings, well, they, they saw, they came to meet me in, uh, which first time I met them was in uh, Santa Barbara. And uh, we, we hit it all pretty good. And they, of course, naturally, they both like, that helps. They both were wild about my paint, you know, paintings. And so they encouraged me to come up to the peninsula on uh, long weekends or something, you know, little, little respites from the, because the, the big mural took two years to do. Mm -hmm. And so when I, was up, when I come up here, they, they encouraged me to, to settle up here. And so I found some lots which had, had, not, uh, had failed because of the Depression at what is now Colbert Hill. But I mean, mm -hmm. it's now in Monterey, but it was outside the city limits. Mm -hmm. And so I bought them I, from my uh, profits from the from the mural, I bought some. Uh, so I understand that you helped other artists. But I, I, I must admit, I bought them for mm -hmm. very little. Very money. little. Money. But you acquired them, and then you you helped other artists build on those parcels. From I didn't understand that. Didn't you give some of those parcels to other artists? Yeah. Then then uh, I mean, uh, Bruce was the first one mm -hmm. because I I bought five lots, and I. Uh, I bought an old trailer, which I picked up, and while I built my house, I, was, I built all my first few houses and studios. Mm -hmm. But then, um, that was five lots, and so I, I built my house on the upper three, and I gave two to Bruce. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was trying, he, he was having a hard time, he, and his, his wife, Jean. I can't, I can't remember quite whether that was, where they just had their first baby, mm -hmm. Barney, or, but Bruce is his name, but I they call him Barney. Now you or whether they were about to have it, that exact, I can't remember that. Anyway, but and then I, I helped some 
I prospered in my way. Mm -hmm. And of course, in those days, money was worth something, you know, mm -hmm. because some of the, for, for instance, the, the um, I got lots for as low as $50 and $75 a piece. Mm -hmm. But to, to people who didn't have any money or didn't have a place to live, mm -hmm. and then I, I knew something about building, I turned out to be a, a good builder. And so I, and I did all the masonry, three fireplaces and, mm -hmm. and four houses. And but you were telling me earlier that Barney Siegel. What? You were telling me earlier, earlier that Barney Siegel helped finance some of the artists. Well, he came over and told me, because Barney Siegel had a, he was foresighted. You see, I was, I entered this gallery before any of these buildings here. It was just a little wooden shack with a, with a, a stove right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And Barney Siegel was young also then and, and aspiring, but he felt that the real estate business would prosper in Carmel if they could attract some artists. And so this was the first, the first, of course now there's a plethora of art galleries all around, as you know, but the, this was the first one, the only one. Mm -hmm. And then of course, people like Armin Hansen and and uh, John O'Shea, who's going to have a show right here. Armin Hansen, they just have a new museum room. They came to my studio on Huckleberry Hill and asked me to, to be a member of this organization. And uh, I said I didn't want to because I, I, was a, I was high and mighty then. I'm still kind of high. Not high, but I'm still. Anyway, <laughs> and I aspired to, I told them I aspired to that I was working for posterity, not prosperity. But that was easy to say because I already had more prosperity <laughs> than other people. Uh -huh. And anyway, um, uh -huh. and Barney Siegel said, well, well, I heard that about you helping people and all that. And so I would like, ordinarily, we only lend people money to build a house if they have some collateral. But I will try to help artists as you have done and and John Steinbeck and people like that and I will I will lend them money without if if they need it to buy some lumber to build a house or anything like that. Well, I had not borrowed money to build my house or mm -hmm. or two studios which I built on the place. One my first studio I built was for my wife, who was a very good painter and is exhibiting right down the street. Um, anyway. Uh, but now you told me a story about how Mr. Steinbeck asked you to do his portrait. Could you talk about how he asked, he said he didn't want the traditional portrait. Well, he, he knew me by then, he knew my painting, and he, he had, before that he had commissioned me to go to Mexico. He had, he had been to Mexico, I had never been, but he, he knew that I had certain limitations with the, with the United States government in painting the mural and things. And he wanted, his own expression was, he wanted to be able to paint out loud. In other words, he felt that I was a creative painter and, and not just a, an Andrew Wyeth type, copying every hair. And, and so that's, and so he commissioned me to go to Mexico and, and he, he liked, I, I worked very hard. And, and, uh, and then when I came back, why he, uh, and Ed, his, his very good friend was Ed Ricketts and uh, they call him Doc because of the, in the books mm -hmm. about Canada they call him, but he, nobody called him Doc, it was Ed Rickett. Anyway, um, he was also very enthusiastic about my work and uh, also we got along, I, uh, you haven't, haven't had time to notice it, but I have a, a facade of facetia and so I'm, I occasionally dip into a, a cesspool of, of humor <laughs> and uh, but they liked that until we had lots. Of but I understand that John, when you did his portrait, he John Steinbeck, he asked if he could come to your studio and write his book. Well, he, yes, he did. He he was he was he was old, ten years old than I am, but he was he was still a young man, but he already had some success, and so he and Ed wanted me to. Um, he didn't want to take the time to pose, like I told you about society portrait, where they dress all up and come. And if you're a literary man, they put books behind you, and and they put collar and tie. Anyway, John was a, a rugged man, and of course, I guess that's one reason we got along because 
he felt I was a rugged young man. And, uh, and building my own places and mm -hmm. topping trees that are 100 feet high and all that stuff. I did all the work myself and I, I, mm -hmm. I can hardly cook a potato now. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, and so then um, he said that in, instead of wasting time posing, could I make a portrait? And he said many of the times I'm, because in, in his early days he would write in a, uh, in a little, Tiny writing, spite of being rugged film, and a ledger. And so I had a large studio then, I have a smaller one now, the one I built myself on the Hill. Yeah. And so he asked if he could paint it. And many of the times he said, Well, I'm writing, I'll, I'll be quite still anyway, I won't be jumping around. And also, it will give you this part the public doesn't appreciate. It will give you an opportunity to make to study me more, to make more studies, because I'll be there day after day. Unlike a society portrait, where they say, I'll be there at four, and I only have, I have to leave it at 4.45, or like this. <laughs> 12 to one, it's supposed to be, isn't it? <laughs> no. And so, anyway, so then he, who, I agreed that he naturally paid me. He commissioned the, the thing, he paid me, before it was done, he's, and there another guy, he taught me, he taught me some things which I remember later and I, he said, I, I want you to paint your kind of painting. I want, I, I, don't, I don't want to give you my approval or disapproval. When you, when you feel you've finished, I'll pay you, then I'll see what you've done. And of course, um, the, the world was, it caused quite a flurry and it's still, they say it's gonna come up, that painting is gonna come up for auction. It went from, of course, uh, from a state to state and, mm -hmm. and accumulated value. And the last I heard of it was that Burgess Meredith had sold it to John Houston and then John Houston died, you know, the director, mm -hmm. and that, that, that it was going to be up for auction. And of course, it, the movie the movie people of old who used to be enthusiastic about work. Mm -hmm. And of course, they would come up to my studio and I would occasionally go down there. But I, I don't do that anymore. I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm a recluse now. Mm -hmm. Partly by necessity. Well, Elwood, what, what, what is abstract impressionism? Well, that's what the critics, the critics had a hell of a time for a long time. Because my painting was, as John and Ed predicted, it was singular and, and not uh, labelable. But then uh, during that time, when I was working, a, a, a bunch of friends of mine in, in San Francisco came up and started what, what some critics call the horse tailors because they said, that was facetious, of course, but it true. They said they backed the horse up against a pallet, and when he swished his tail, <laughs> you've probably seen some of them. Anyway, those are called, then they created quite a, quite a to-do in the art world, mm -hmm. because if they were, at that time, the main influence was trying to break away from European painting, because Matisse and Picasso and all those had been such an influence in New York, and then it seeped down to them. And so, um, the, uh, they, they were nonplussed about my work, and then they, and then there were several of the leading critics in New York and one in San Francisco uh, remarked about me possibly being the leading colorist in the country and orchestrating with color. Well, of course, that's a little like this one here. Well, what is art, Elwood? What, what, is, what is art? I didn't understand that. What is art? What is art? Well, of course, Nancy art is, is creativity in the in a search for singularity and search for beauty. But naturally, that's the same in dance or in, in music or anything. I, naturally, I, my field is painting. It's visual art, in other words. But visual art is not the only kind of art. And 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 writing, creative writing. I remember having discussions with John about like mice and men, you know, he was worried about, it's, he said, not long enough to be a novel and it's not short enough to be a short story. I said, if you said what you had to say, then that's it. And, and Ed and I, and he were sitting together, and bo both Ed and I agreed that since you said all you had to say and stop there, it might even be an example in the universities after, and, and of course, years later, Stanford University and others used it, or John had, had gone to Stanford several times, 
as an example of, of good writing, in a sense, even if I have a story to tell, tell it, shut up, go and have a beer. And, uh, <laughs> That's great. Can I have a beer? A little, a little more than that. Let's say I'm a young person and I'm getting out of high school and I come to you and I say that I really want to be an artist, yeah. but my parents think I'm crazy. What would you say to me? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that my parents thought the same thing and they threw me out and they, and they disinherited me. They said that I would never even be informed of their death or they would never inherit a handkerchief or anything unless I would become a certified public accountant. And I said, I don't want to be a certified, but my father was. And of course, I was, I was, uh, did very well in school. And, uh, and so, and of course also, if you can project yourself beyond your years, there used to, in America, and there used to be father and son, you, you remember that. Everything was father and son, father. And mm -hmm. the, anyway, the, uh, so I was, I was um, compatible and, um, understanding of people who said that their parents didn't appro approve of their being alive. So did that happen for you? Did your family, did your family cut you off? Oh yeah, that happened, yeah, they did it. And, then, and that's one reason I came west too, because I, I had nothing. Oh. I had nothing even on the way. I, I had, I worked all, all night, several times for 25 cents an hour in those days. Mm -hmm. furnishing my own transportation and food. Mm -hmm. And so when I came out to California, I, I, I looked at the map, I had just enough for gasoline. Gasoline, then I was paying 10 cents a gallon for gasoline. <laughs> I don't think you can get it for that anymore. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so I, I had just enough to make it to California. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I had a, a bag of oranges. And I would look at the speedometer. Mm -hmm. And every, I, I, I couldn't afford to stop on that or to drive straight to. Every hundred miles, I figured, or, or maybe it was 200 miles, I would have an orange while I was in those days traffic. I had a, I had a little old, old Ford Roadster and I could drive it with my hand. Traffic was on Highway 66, which no longer in existence. So are you happy? And then it all, yeah, I almost, I almost got stalled though because when I came to, there's a big incline, at least there used to be on 66, as you came in toward Los Angeles before you mm -hmm. went down. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Dust Bowl people, you know, the Okies and all, whom later John wrote about. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he, he questioned me some about, about my experience with them. Anyway, they had old trucks broken down and they had all their belongings. They'd, they'd been escaping Oklahoma and all that. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't make it up that hill. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had a Ford, all I had was a little paint materials in a bank. And so I would, I would pull them up over the hill and I'd go back for another one. And pretty soon I realized I was going to run out of gas and not get to California myself. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had to go. So you're, you're happy with your decision, Ben. What? You're happy with your decision. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. I've lived a very full life. Mm -hmm. And I've, um, I've, I've always been full of something and vinegar. And uh, so, <laughs> however, I, I, I tell people now, you friend me, that I'm losing all my moxie because I used to, I used to, go, I, I also was a, a, a uh, an athlete and a, a boxer in college, and so I always felt that I could either run or beat my way out of the situation. And now, heavens, uh, the, these kids on skateboards or bicycle, they can knock me over easily on that. I can't even jump out of the way. Well, uh, how old are you? I'm, I'm, I'm a few days from 82. Uh -huh. So I, I'm not like the, the youngsters who you ask them what they are. I'm three and a half years old. <laughs> you were saying that your longevity was due to your good genes. Yeah, yeah and also the fact I've never smoked. I've never, uh, of course, when I was young, I didn't afford to afford a drink. Oh, it was only when John Steinbeck or Robinson Jeffers or somebody like that would, would give me a drink today because I couldn't, I couldn't waste money on it. I was raising four little kids, building houses without mortgages, you know, just paying for the little lumber and the rocks and my art materials. And I also had a, a wife who was a painter using more art materials than I was because she was a little more flamboyant about some things. Anyway, um, 
So I, I, I just couldn't afford any liquor. Now I can afford it. I said, told you, I could, my, some of my friends want me to go to Paris and just drink absinthe or mint juleps or whatever I want all day and all night. And have a, have a, live in the French Quarter and have a different wench every night or something. I, that would kill me, of course. <laughs> it would kill me to have the same wench every night. <laughs> you were telling me that when people ask if there's a woman in your life, you say... There are women in my life now, yeah, there's a particular woman, but she is, a, uh, as I told you, they're all much brighter than I, like Ed and John and people like that. Mm -hmm. And she is a doctor um, and a, a university professor, and she comes down on weekends and things like that from, mm -hmm. from San Jose. Mm -hmm. and, um, but the woman that you woo <coughs> most of the time, but the woman that you... I, but I was married twice, legal, legally both times. Yeah. yeah, but earlier when we talked, you said that there was a woman that you woo a lot of the, most of the time, and it's your mood. Oh yeah, well that's a, that's just a little, <laughs> that's just a little of my facetious. But you, when people come and visit, you're when they're buying paintings, and, mm -hmm. and they often buy them directly from me. Now they get, and uh, they ask you things, and you have to be a little bit entertaining you have to answer. Anyway, I do. But you paint I, all. My, you know, you know what the word "muse" means, right, I think. Sure. And so I tell them that I am. Sometimes I tell them, hey, if I'm finishing a painting, I'm, 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 I tell them I'm, I'm fornicating right now, because I have wooed her and brought her up. What I mean, I build a painting, and I build a painting just like I build buildings. It's it's different from most of these painters around. Mm -hmm. And and that's what, of course one of the things that impresses critics and and people like, you know, and that is I, I get a concept. And uh, and then I I had go into what I call my Yankee Doodle period, which is the same as a composer would mm -hmm. noodle around on a piano because I want to try to find the big melodies and things like that. And then I then I start embellishing on that mm -hmm. with and then this is one of the things that makes has made my career more prominent than others in what. I call dynamic chiaroscuro, and if you know, you you're familiar with the word. No. Chiaroscuro is a is an art. It's a rather common art word. It's it's a Italian der derivation, and it means a black and white relationship, uh, just like a a traditional photograph would be chiaroscuro. Mm -hmm. And um, and of course, the reason Ansel Adams. I don't know, imagine these people have heard of Ansel Adams, mm -hmm. and one reason he, his paintings came up above. I mean, his time came up with it, is that he came to realize the dynamic quality of chiaroscuro and so he altered his photographs. He took out a lot of medium grays and made, and if, you, if you've seen some amphibians yeah, on uh -huh. it, you know, like trees or rocks or, anything, or moonlight or anything, mm -hmm. he made the contrast and it, it, it helped the composition. So after, after I do that chiaroscuro study, mm -hmm. then I go into orchestra study in color because I'm considered a colorist. And of course, that's, that's when my muse starts taking her clothes off. Um, yeah, you understand, I mean, I mean my muse, no, no particular lady. Right. <laughs> and, uh, right. and then I get all excited, and, say, and the things start, and then put in textures. And that's when the oil painting becomes important because most critics say, all the critics I've ever read, say that oil painting is so far ahead of acrylic Although acrylic is a, it was invented during my time, there wasn't any. It, it because um, oil painting is a it's a fuller orchestration. You have the equivalent, the visual equivalent of the ob, of the of the oboe and the, and the strings and the timpanis and, and so you, you. And that's when I, I I tell people that sometimes I I slip away from my muse because I have to be Arturo Toscanini because I have my car is great now, I study surround, I have to do the final thing. Mm -hmm. And so the... Mm -hmm. Great. A, a, it's a process of, uh, that the critics call the most profound of pain, in, in visual painting. But of course, a lot of, a lot of people are, are what it, are called a la prima paintings. They want to just start and finish and sometimes even... This is true. I've known painters who set an alarm clock and said, I don't want to... I don't want to take more than 45 minutes in the painting, and I'll sign it because I'm, it, it might. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I worked in New York City, and I had a little 
they adored me in New York City, contrary to when I first went there, and I had success there, but <coughs> some of the uh, dealers were, uh, they were too big for their trousers. They would come in and say, well, we can sell that. Just sign it. And I'd tell them, I'm not pleased with it. I'm not, I'm not proud of it. I don't want to be represented. Man. Oh, come on, man. And that, 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 that's the attitude. And then as I told you, some painters, uh, well, I, I, I want to go down to, and I lived in Greenwich Village for a while. I want to go down and have mm -hmm. some fun at noon. And so I'll, I'll paint for an hour, and then I'll sign it, and then I'll go down. And, and all that while, I, little L was just stewing over a concept. And now I'm painting that, which I just completed along with this one, a big one, bigger mm -hmm. than this, mm -hmm. which I couldn't, uh, I'm not strong enough to carry up the stairs. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's called the Comer Angel. And the reason it's called the Comer Angel is when I was growing up, I was very enthusiastic about Thomas Wolfe, who was an important writer. And beside my, and uh, when, when I got a divorce, I lost a lot of my book, uh, books and houses and things. And so I, I, I rebought a new version of the Comer Angel, and it's lying beside my bed. And uh, I have I, I live in, in in elegance now, in the sense that I have oriental rugs, mm -hmm. antiques, and a, mm -hmm. a 400 year old four poster bed with curtains around and everything like that. Special counter pen. I also tell told people even when I was poor, I told them that. And Ed and John appreciated that. I had a baronial complex. Mm -hmm. And and so then when I when I built my original house, it got to be the the show place of um, Huckleberry Hill because I spent so much time on fancy floors and hand carved doors. And that was the baronial complex coming out. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt that I never wanted to waste money on psychiatry. So in order to avoid that, I would be honest about my things my weaknesses, you see, and... Uh, mm. Wonderful. Do you know of his, of his theories about color? Yeah, uh, he, 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 he was a late comer in a sense of painting, and he, he came across uh, a certain isms in painting mm -hmm. before, uh, I mean, af after they were... And so they were new to him, you see, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and uh, op art and things like that. And, uh, of course, I... I I had been painting all my life, and so I, I was a little more aware of all those things. And uh, but yes, I, he he got very um, uh, well involved. He partook of some of those isms. I, I myself have have refused to join some organizations that would invited me in. But if I would sign a in a manifesto limiting myself and my ideas and I, I would never do that because I want I, I want to change my and even Ed and John and uh, a few other uh, people around Henry Miller possibly and, and, and when my painting departed from the things they liked because I suddenly went into a period called pictographs and the whole nation got excited about that before I exhibited I don't know how it got around. And that gave me a national reputation because no one had ever done pictographs. I was surprised because I had, I, I had, I, and for a time I owned a home in New Mexico as well as here. I spent my time in Taos and, and Santa Fe. And of course I was aware of the, of the Indians and I loved them. And I had, John had previously sent me to Mexico and, and of course Mexico, People don't realize Mexico is full of Indians. <laughs> they were all Indians before the Spaniards came and raped them. I mean, not just the women, raped everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, uh, so anyway, the uh, I, I don't remember where I was going. Oh, well, we're going uh, yeah, we asked you about the colorist. Jehana and his oh, color yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah I said, and of course, naturally, I, I studied those things and I went through them and I left them and also um, when I went to Archer, they had color wheels near the end. You, you could see where they color. And then, then uh, I start doing things my way. And then some of the some of the modern uh, 
musicians start buying my work because they said, you discovered a visual dissonant, which we weren't allowed to use in music until the 20th century. In other words, a departure from the, mm -hmm. in music and in dance and everything. And mm -hmm. Merce Cunningham, I knew, I knew them and all. Mm -hmm. And they were, although uh, uh, my, my daughter and her daughter are both prominent dancers, one was ballet, traditional ballet with Swan Lake, you know, fluttering at the end. And the other was modern dance. We had a concert right here a, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, and she was doing she was doing all the choreography, but also the head dancer of flamenco, mm. which is entirely different from traditional ballet. Wonderful. But she, she is the daughter of my daughter, and so she comes in. But I was the the reason that I had the degree of recognition I had was they, they felt that in the West I was for one of the first 20th century people. Of course, this is way back. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I've lived almost the whole 20th century. I don't know if I live any longer. I don't know whether I'll, I'll make it uh, aesthetically into the 21st century. <laughs> but there's a good deal of argument about when that'll be, whether the year 2000 is, you've heard, you've heard mm -hmm. of that. The transition of where the air comes from. Well, I'll have trouble making it to 2000. I'll worry about that when I get there. <laughs> Could you talk about this painting a little bit, please? Yeah, well, this, I, I like music, of course, but the, the title of this will be, will be confusing to a lot of people. I guess they've got it there. And the title is Quartet, because I was doodling, and I, and I wanted something, uh, I'm an admirer of Modrian, and if you, in case you don't know, Art Modrian was one of the first men who completely exploited gravity. And uh, uh, in the visual arts, that's another thing that a lot of young painters don't understand, but builders do, because they have their A forms, and they have their pyramidal things, and they have their architectonics, and they know that horizontal is different from vertical and things like that. Well, it's also true in composition of paintings. And so I, 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 I deliberately sat down to do something deliberately uh, simple so that I would be able to use, concentrate on color and texture. And so I did something and, and then I thought, that is n not right, not enough the way I want it, so I will I will ape a piece of music which has variations on a theme. And so I will do it four times, like four movements, and they'll be orchestrated. They won't be the same, they won't be asymmetrical, but I'll let, I'll let my creativity go, but at the same time, I'll have those four things generally repeated, and that's why I will quart, call it quartet, and that's why that has a double meaning, because a lot of, I have done, paintings which involved the semblance of, of a, a, a quartet. I, I knew, a, I knew a, a very a prominent quartet in San Francisco once, and, uh, and they were world known, and, and I know what quartet music is, you see. But in this case, I say it has a double meaning because it's, quite, it's, it's, it's like four movements, four things related. And that's why I didn't know when I titled, I still don't know, if you fellows have been to college, you can tell me I'm wrong. I didn't know whether to use, on the end of the, to use double T-E or, or just E-T, because uh, uh, there, there's a difference, there's a difference in inflection, a uh -huh. semanticist, you know. I have, I, I always wanted to live long enough to study semant semantics, but I, but I, I got intrigued in painting, but I'm still, I'm still interested, and uh, yeah, I can't answer. And when I use a word like abecedarian, yeah. sometimes because it it has such an interesting derivation, I sometimes even here at the gallery, it, sometimes they criticize me for not this, but for some of the titles that I use because they say that the public will not understand them, and sometimes it, I I it, I launder. I one of my specials is laundering euphemisms, and I tell them sometimes that some people cannot discriminate between their anal orifice and a terrestrial excavation. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll let them figure that out. <laughs> Can you talk about this piece, please? I'll look. This piece. Yeah. This piece here. Yeah. Well, uh, that is 
is one of my quicker types of painting and uh, I do something which a violinist I met in um, in Santa Barbara, a very well-known uh, violinist, I'll think of his name again, he died just recently, but he used, I saw him in concerts here later. Here. Anyway, he, he told me that you ha that in spite of the fact that he had, he had an international career in violining, that you have to keep your hand in. And so he said, instead of doing like some artists and lying fallow after you've done an important work, do a lighter work to kind of keep your hand in. I was, because he said, I do scales every day during the summer. I, I train, I train on the, on the beach because the, the, the winter course of concerts is hard on him, but I do my scales in spite of the fact that I naturally had a Stradivarius and a Canarius, expensive violins and all that. And so, and so I, once in a while, and then I became a good friend of Armand Hansen, and he, Hansen was very enthusiastic in my work, but, but he was a robust fellow, and he'd say, Christ, boy, you just keep on paying. You can't do that. You, you've got a live fellow, and, let, and let, let it bubble up again. And I told him about the story about the, 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 the violinist who, I'll think of his name, very prominent name, but that's, that's part of my senility. Uh, not being able to remember names, I don't know who I am, but I, I think I'm, my name is Madonna. <laughs> and, oh, what I noticed that you don't sign your paintings in the traditional lower right-hand corner. I, I sign them according to the composition of the painting, uh -huh. where, where it looks the best. And the, of course, the, um, the, there's a story there, too, in the sense of my early paintings. Some, some dealers now are searching the, the country for my early paintings, because I have some late ones, and different things acquired strange values in the world. And my early paintings, before I was sure of my ego, I signed them E. Graham, my first name is Elwood. Now I just, and then after a while I said, Jesus Christ, I said, I'm, I'm, my paintings are recognizable. I could just be Graham. But now two of, my, two of my four children paint under the name of Graham and some other people. I have, t have come up, and so I, to authenticate the paintings, I write Elwood Graham big on the backs. But the people who, some, some people are diligently looking around for paintings that are signed E. Graham because they think they are my, they're my formative, which they are. And then also they, I used to sell my, I used to sell my paintings for $25 frame, but I made the frames myself, and I, now they, they're, they're $25,000. Not all of them, but the big, big ones. And uh, that, of course, naturally inflation, you know. <laughs> so this painting was kind of like a light break in between bigger and more important works? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah because I didn't do what I told you about the other things. I didn't, it just set up a still life. I have a bunch of antiques in my house, but I also like rye bread. I thought that was kind of sly. Mm -hmm. I like, I eat rye bread and, and cheese and beer as a break, you know, and I think that's the one, yeah, there's rye bread in there, and, um, and then I, I have some nice china, and, and I have a yard full of flowers, a typical sort of larger yard, and, uh, and so I just set them up in my studio and start painting, but that's not the way I do the painting that you had there before. Uh, or this one. You wouldn't mind talking about the painting that's up there, right? Well, now. that that is, is one of my paintings, which, in a formative conceptual state, started from a, a, a philosophic phrase, and so I I have painted a lot of birds. I've studied birds, but, I, but a lot of my bird paintings are they're all uh, uh, ornithologically incorrect uh, because I just. I just um, do it my way any way I want. However, and this was the the title of the painting is "Even a Caged Bird Still Sings," and so by I was get, able to get, use some ge what I referred to before some geometrics with the cage and some arabesques with the and thereby get a balance which I thought a balance mm -hmm. and naturally the public has to make their own decision. And, and so the, the, the indications in the, 
Negative space is a negative space. Being photographers, you know what a negative space is. Are indications of a birdcage, mm -hmm. and then the 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 bird is painted freely enough to to indicate philosophically again that it is a free spirit in spite of being caged. And there there is the philosophic thing. But naturally, pardon me. I, my main concern is having ideas and working out my ideas, and sometimes they're facetious, sometimes they're casual, sometimes they're, and, uh, and the one you saw before was just a respite between um, more serious work. But of course my, uh, some people adore the one that you saw before because my experience in clinging the paint, the, 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 the craftsmanship comes out in it. I'm sorry I don't have one of my uh, horses. Uh -huh. I used to own three horses. And it, well, sometimes they nuzzle each other. It, look, it looks a little romantic. You've seen our horses that were getting romantic. And so don't screw up your face against me. And, uh, <laughs> and so I, I had, I, I, I owned three horses once and I had some pencil sketches of different moves. And, but I, I love zebras. And uh, because of, uh, in the discussions at the lab with, with John and Ed, you know, which late afternoon, they, they we used to, we all worked during the day, and then we were we were drinking beer, having fun, and I, I hope nobody can hear some of the things I say. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm told it because of my deafness. I'm speaking a stentorian voice sometimes. Anyway, um, they ask what what the what my greatest, highest ideal was. We were just making fun. And I said it was to have a warm seraglio. Now you know what a seraglio is, don't you? It's a, I know, a whorehouse. Yeah. Anyway, and I would have a beautiful young woman, whom I owned, <laughs> and of course this is that, and she would be nude, and I would have her tattooed in stripes because I loved zebras, and then I could sit while I was having my my wine and cheese and watch her cavort around. And so, as as, you, as a proliferation of that idea, I and of course I had been to Hearst Castle several times. You know, they have a whole thing. Mm -hmm. I'd been to San Diego Zoo and San Luis Zoo. So then I took some of my horse sketches and then, and then I, I thought that I would combine my idea. I wouldn't put the lady in there. But also I would thwart the traditional idea of 19th century painting where the background had to be way back if we're going up here. Because this is, this is, is a, an invention well, of mine and, and lots of people in Greece call equivocal spacing, where you tried to make, and the, the idea came from Cezanne, where you try to make the, uh, what did he call it? Uh, oh, you were trying to make a, a painting, not a photograph. You know, you fellas a photograph, you know. And you were trying to make it a unit, but he had another word for it, I'm trying to think of. And so the peripheral spaces or the negative spaces would also be integrated with the other. In order to do that, I took my abstract, my abstract ideas, wove them right in with the stripes of the zebra, and still had to, uh, tried to retain a little of the affection that they have for each other, a, a little touch of romance. I don't remember, unless it's on the back, I don't remember what I call it, what the title is wanted me for a large sum to paint a um, what was that bird which frequents the swamp uh, I can't think of the name now and I did paint that bird but I didn't paint it I, there again I let go and painted it with the, with the tree in it if you've ever been in a swamp there's all kinds of roots coming up and there's all kinds of things hanging so I, I did it my way he was, very, he was very disappointed in that he, if he compared it with his book, you see, it wasn't exact. 
Uh, yeah, bird people are like that. They want it, Roger Torrey Peterson, they want every feather to be right there so that they can identify it and say, ah, yeah, red-winged blackbird. That's what it is. Well, an, Eng an English lady was there buying a painting once, and she said, well, in England, I'm a bird. <laughs> Which uh, apparently is one of their... Oh, yeah, it's slang for, it's like a chick. Well, are you going to ever lay down your brushes and say I'm through? Are you going to yes, retire? I, I, I looked, I looked I, if somebody was there uh, a couple of days ago buying a couple of paintings, and I, I said when I looked out of my, one side of my present studio is all glass. I look out there, there's, there's some son of a bitch out there in a long robe and a scythe, and he keeps sharpening it. And I just stick my tongue out at him. And, uh, and I, I told him I had it. I had a friend, uh, a very prominent American painter called Thomas Cart, Hart Benton, dead now. And I tell him the, the true story about him and several other painters I've known or read about who have, um, their painting kept them alive. And Thomas Hart Benton wanted, he, he, he was a heavy drinker and he wanted to, he'd made some money and he did some money and he wanted to quit. No. And when, when Harry Truman, was out of the presidency and went back to his, his rather humble home in, I think it was Lamar, um, sorry. anyway, he, um, and the, the Democrats got together money for a presidential library, which is a common thing, and, and, and uh, they wanted um, Thomas Hart Benton because all of his forebears had been leading politicians and uh, wanted to do a mural for the library. And he said, no, I'm, I'm finished, I'm quit. Anyway, a little Bantam cock Harry, you know, with his way, he went and put the squitch on, on Thomas Hart Benton and, and persuaded him to, he said, you can, you can go back to the bottle as soon as you finish this. And uh, anyway, um, he got him to do the murals. Right? And, and uh, Thomas Hart Benton had a, a, a good uh, wife. I have to give yourself a good wife. You didn't hear that, did you? <laughs> um, uh, like um, the same as Harry, Harry did, you know, Bess Truman. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, she took care of him, and and then he would take the he'd paint during the weekdays, and then he'd, he'd take off. When he got near the closing part of the of the mural, he worked all week, and he worked clear through all Saturday and all Sunday. He laid down and died. It was finished. And that, that often happens.